like 20 years I'm dealing with uh, Active Directory and uh, different kinds of access in a Microsoft environment. So that's pretty much my background right now. Uh, my official title is Digital Advisor, which means that for the past 20 years I was Analog Advisor. But well, that happened. So I will be speaking today uh, about applications in a hybrid environment and in Azure AD environment. Uh, so uh, what I will cover today is application access basics based on the Azure AD and then a bit more uh, advanced scenarios, how you can take advantage of Azure AD to manage access to the SaaS applications, how, you, how it works, some uh, conclusions from what we do for customers, what we do internally at Predica. Uh, I will speak about web application proxy and how you can use it to access on-prem application and I will show you some weird scenario with that, uh, which uh, might have practi practical use or not, but actually we are using it a lot. And uh, I think this will not be like all the nuts and bolts session. It's more about scenarios, how to use it with some conclusions and notes from the trenches. If you, are, if you have a specific question which is not covered, just shoot it. Let's keep it informal and, and have a questions. So, uh, my goal for this uh, session for you was to, uh, I would like that when you will be, after this session, you will understand how you can use Azure AD actually uh, to grant access to applications for users. And what is this giving you to you? Because that is actually, a, a, there is actually a lot of scenarios you can cover. And uh, from my work with my customers, it's not like very, very obvious. Sometimes we, have, we are having this aha moment yeah, that, okay, you can do it. And then I was once at a customer and they, uh, like, we, we showed them a few of those scenarios and then we spent three hours just adding the next applications because it was, oh my God, it is working, yeah. Uh, and I will also uh, highlight a few problems with that, which you all should be aware. Uh, it is all based on the true stories, so there is no, uh, like, theoretical scenarios, whatever I will show, you, show it to you today. This is something we did for customers or what customers are doing. I will show you also some problems. Um, to beef up the, like the problem of, with this uh, presentation, I have a lot of windows. I will try to not, not mess up between them. And this is my pres first presentation on Mac. So uh, there is a lot of things which can go wrong. So <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but all the things you are looking here, you will be seeing here, they are actually being used by the real users, by the real scenarios, by, by the customers. Yeah. So uh, it's very important uh, that this is uh, something with, uh, with practical use. So first, uh, let's state the problem and let's uh, also state the opportunity. So why we are doing all this hybrid identity? So the, the only reason actually why we're doing this is to grant people access to applications and the data. There's no other reason, yeah. So uh, we might think about all the synchronization, getting Azure AD because it's cool, it's in the cloud, whatever. But actually we are doing this only to grant people access to the applications in less or more secure way to address some scenarios. That's the main reason for that. And that's also the main reason we are dealing with identity, in my opinion. Yeah? It's only to, to, to grant people access to the data. And uh, what we were doing uh, for the last 20 years when I'm in the industry, uh, so we were doing this on premises and we started to understand, like at the end we started to understand how it works on premises, yeah. Uh, to my surprise, it's still a problem on premises. So that is actually uh, my tweet from the previous week when I uh, explained for a hundred times how the, how the Kerberos is working and I make the Kerberos double hop working again. And that was like, oh my God, we are 2017 and we are still dealing with it. And then we have all those SaaS and cloud applications. So how will we will move there yeah, if people are still having problems on premises? But we will not be talking about the Kerberos uh, a lot, but we will. So with the cloud actually, so with the, with the adoption of the, of the SaaS applications mostly, uh, we are getting into a completely new realm and completely new set of problems. Because right now what is happening is that uh, we are not controlling the applications anymore. So uh, 
typical scenario for our customers right now is that marketing department is just buying some application and then they are coming to IT and they are saying, you know what, we need a single sign-on to that, just fix it, yeah. And then a lot of those applications which are advertised as a SaaS, they are actually a fake SaaS, as I call it. So basically somebody took an uh, on-prem application, they are hosting this on AWS, and they are saying, okay, how do you want to provision people there? Send me the CSV, yeah? And then they will import the CSV and you are done. How do you offboard them? We don't know. And uh, what do you do for a single sign-on? We support XAML. How do you support XAML? Uh, well, we did this, and then if you will dig into it, there is a lot of like shortcuts in the XAML implementations. That's what I found out. So uh, we have a, a SaaS applications, we have a web hosted applications, we have still majority on-prem applications, which we have to deal with. And uh, I know this is a buzzword right now, or it's like uh, repeated all the time, but actually there is no perimeter right now. Yeah, so people are working all over the places. And if uh, the one thing which is going away right now for many of our customers are VPNs. So they are getting rid of VPNs because like, if you are a user, you don't like VPN. It's always trouble, it's blocked, it doesn't work. Uh, so we are getting the people who are using different devices, like I just switched to Mac, I can use my iPhone, and then uh, I want to get just access to my applications. And uh, <coughs> the problem is that whatever we, we got on premises, it's not working anymore. Yeah, so Kerberos is not working on premise, uh, outside of our premises. Microsoft, by the way, was like trying to get into it and look if it can make be, if it can be made to work for a cloud, but actually it is not, yeah. So we have a couple of scenarios uh, and we have to cover it. So let's start with a new Contoso, which is Predica. Uh, I will be showing this all in Tenant. Predica is a company which has some on-premises resources. Actually, in our case, that's not on-premises. We have everything in the cloud, that's Azure. And then uh, we are past synchronization. We have Azure AD Tenant. We are using some standard uh, Microsoft applications like Office 365, CRM, Visual Studio. They will work because they are Microsoft World, yeah. So this is our starting point, and uh, we have a user. User is called Tom, uh, which is short for Thomas, of course. Uh, he has his organizational account, so he is working outside of his premises using Azure AD account. The truth is that when you're getting to this point, for those applications here, it doesn't matter how you're authenticating here. Yeah? So whatever is happening here, applications don't know that. So important is that you have your organizational account and how we can use your organizational account to enable access to the apps. So let's do some basics and let's do uh, SaaS applications first. So Azure AD and SaaS. Uh, we want to onboard a new application for a SaaS, uh, like SaaS application for a Predica, for a, for a Tom. And actually there are a couple of options. Uh, first of all, Azure AD has some predefined applications. Yeah? So you, if you are using Salesforce, you, you can just click, provide some information, it will work. Microsoft did it for you, so it's simple. Then applications might be written against Azure AD. Uh, so they might be written from the start to work with Azure AD. I will not delve into it. That's a topic for a separate session. Uh, it sounds fairly simple because there are libraries, but there is, a, there is many places you can do it wrong. Like first thing which uh, we are seeing is that nobody like understands uh, or many people don't understand like what, what is the single tenant versus multi-tenant application, yeah. And uh, a lot of customers right now are getting a multiple tenant setup. They have a multiple companies and they want to use the same application for in the multiple companies. Somebody is writing this application and it's written against single tenant. And then that's something we have to, uh, uh, like we have to educate developers about. And the third thing is that uh, we are buying some SaaS applications. So there's already a SaaS application we want to onboard, yeah? And in those cases, uh, for Azure AD, it's XAML. So Joe was speaking about WS Fed and XAML. So WS Fed, uh, it doesn't exist in the wild, except of SharePoint. But <laughs> so uh, actually, if you will be getting any, XAML, any application which has to be integrated with Azure AD, that will be XAML, yeah? Uh, XAML is a funny protocol, uh, except if it's written for Azure AD, it's, it is using Open, a, open, open AD Connect, but we will focus on XAML today. 
That was funny because uh, that's uh, a protocol which was announced that like 10 years ago and it's still there and it will be there because enterprises are using XAML. So uh, it has some issues, it has a security issues, but actually I don't think that XAML will be gone anytime soon. And uh, writing application against XAML is really pain, uh, but uh, with Azure AD, using XAML applications is actually somehow simpler, yeah. Uh, but not perfect. So first of all, uh, Azure AD is giving you XAML support out of the box. So if you have an Azure AD, you are supporting XAML. Uh, the, what you need to remember is that it requires Azure AD Premium. So if you have a free version of Azure AD, actually you cannot use it. So you have to be on an EMS or have Azure AD Premium P1 uh, to support it. Uh, second, it's very simple to use. I will show it to you in a moment. Actually, there is a wizard, you are going through it. And then uh, if you will set it, set it up right, it will just work, yeah? Uh, and setting, setting up right means that you have to understand what is on the other side. Because as I said, developers often are getting this wrong or they are making a lot of shortcuts on the XAML implementation. So uh, like even assertions names. So you have to get to know what assertion names, like claims they are expecting what uh, signing protocol algorithm they are using. So you need to ask them all those questions. So for that, you need to understand how XAML works. And uh, then you just need to configure the app, uh, configure attributes mapping. I will go over it, I will show it to you. Assign application to the users and it should work, yeah? Should means that uh, there are a couple of things good to know. Uh, first of all, Azure AD can source XAML attributes or assertions only from Azure AD. So if you are configuring what will be in a token, so you are limited only to what is in your Azure AD right now. You cannot go to uh, your on-prem AD or to some SQL database, pull something up. It, it has to be in Azure AD, yeah. Second is uh, Azure AD uh, is, is not allowing you to do any claim transformation. So if you need to transform the attribute form or attribute value, do some transformation, you have to do it on premises and sync it to Azure AD or do, the, do it in AD Connect. So uh, for example, if you need some attribute which is not email as a user identifier, so you have to sync it to some extension attribute and use it as a user identifier. Uh, some competitive products like Okta, for example, they allow very rich transformation of the attributes on issuance of the claims. Yeah, here we have to do the work on premises and sync it to the Azure AD. And uh, it's very simple to set up. There is an option in a, in a portal. So uh, I found out that there is a, something which is called demo conference, which is uh, giving me unlimited number of that kind of slides. You will see more of them. Uh, so let's see how it works. Uh, so I'm here on my Azure portal. That's something which, uh, that's a bit off topic, but that was kind of realization I had recently that Azure is actually happening to be like a workbench for identity people because I have here my tenant, I have my privilege identity manager, I have here identity protection and access review and there is more and more which is coming. So actually I work here with my identity, yeah which was pretty interesting that I realized that all I need to do with the identity I'm doing here, yeah. When you go to Azure AD, uh, you have this option here, enterprise applications, and this is allowing you to control uh, uh, applications your company is using. It is different than app registration here. App registration is when you are writing application, you are writing your own application for Azure AD, and you have to register it, so this is app registration. If you are using something like ready application, this is enterprise applications. People are getting this often confused, yeah. So if you want to configure a new application, that actually we are going here, we can just click it. And here's the option, non-gallery application. If we click it, we have a couple of options. One of them is XAML, yeah. Uh, actually going through the setup is very boring. So I'll just show you, we have an application, it's called 7Gs. Uh, it's a performance management application. We use it internally at Predica to uh, do very nice things like uh, saying nice things about the, our uh, employees. Uh, 
Uh, and we have a couple of options here. Here is single sign-on. So for single sign-on mode, we have a XAML. This is Azure portal, so it needs to load. And I don't have ready jokes, so you'll have to wait. <laughs> uh, there's a couple of things here uh, worth uh, seeing. Yeah. Yesterday was an outage of Azure in North America, and yesterday nothing was working here. That was. I hope it will work. Azure or the network? Uh, I don't know. All the services in uh, North America were uh, like red, so. Yeah. 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 So. Uh, I will try it again. Uh, If it will be not working, I have it recorded. So I, I'm covered. I have it recorded. Uh, but I would like to uh, show it to you live. Uh, so let's try. Uh, actually, there is a second version of the portal, which is preview. And uh, apparently, it is working. <laughs> so. If not, I will just switch to the recording. That's the uh, beauty of the live demos. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, uh, so I have it recorded. I will just show it to you because uh, that started like yesterday. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. I will just, uh, I have entire setup and everything recorded. Uh, sorry for that, but I cannot do anything about it really. Uh, but the, the, it's not about the region, it's uh, uh, like portal is not working, yeah? So we don't have a control on that. So we have this application here. Uh, okay, we can, uh, so this is the new application setup. This is limiting a bit of what I can, uh, okay. And then we have all applications, so we have this application for XAML. If you will click it, there is a couple of options. I will do a pause here. Yeah, single sign-on. And then, uh, so uh, when you are setting up a XAML application, the, other, the application needs, needs to provide you some configuration. You have to put it here, like a uh, application URI. Uh, this is something they are giving to you. And then there is, uh, here we have a, 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 yeah, so here we have a, user identifier and attributes. So this is, this is the place where you're actually uh, configuring your attributes mapping. So you are getting the attribute from Azure AD and you are saying what kind of assertion it will uh, release. And then here you can see that the name is uh, something strange, but uh, it is allowing, if, if your application requires like very specific uh, assertion name, so you can just type it, it's a free form, yeah? So they are not providing a strict schema, but you can just type it. Uh, so we are doing the mappings of the, of the attributes. It's very simple. Uh, as I said, only what you have uh, in Azure AD, uh, so you can release it as an assertion for, uh, for app. Yes. What is the user identifier? User identifier is actually uh, whatever you want, yeah? So you are specifying just what will be the value of it, and it is released as a name ID uh, claim, yeah? So it's all about, you have to ask your application provider what they expect as a name ID, uh, are they expecting user principal name, are they expecting something else, configure a mapping here, and it will be released as a, as a user ID. And then uh, here you have a, a actually certificate management. So uh, when you are setting application, uh, you are generating a new certificate. Here is a create a new certificate. And this is very important. It is generating an application specific metadata here. So here is where you can download metadata, send to your provider, and they can configure it. Yeah. Uh, there are a couple of uh, quirks here. So when I was doing this, for example, I click like signing certificate uh, just to view it. 
and then uh, apparently it deleted the certificate, so I had to generate it again. But actually, you can have a multiple certificates. Just select which one is uh, which one is uh, the current one. Yeah. Thomas. Yes. There's a, an option in ARM uh, in the application portion there where you can actually uh, you can either download the metadata if you have a SAML service provider, or you can exchange metadata with the SAML SD. Yes. One thing we've noticed, that, I don't know if it's a bug, but apparently the token signing certificate has been included in the online metadata endpoint. Isn't it included? Isn't. No. Oh, I haven't noticed it because yeah. So the thing with the metadata is that. Uh, they should actually, uh, so the best way if your application can pull this metadata, so you can provide them URL, yeah? But uh, in our practice, I found very little applications actually doing it. So typically, you are sending the metadata. So actually, none of the applications I'm using is using the metadata endpoint. We are sending this XML, so I haven't noticed it. So that's good to know. Yeah, 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 I understand it. That it's, because if you will download it, it's a certificate is there, yeah? If not, uh, but uh, the gentleman is saying that if you are pointing to the URL of the Meta Federation metadata, signing certificate is not included. It might be, I haven't checked that. So then I can just go to the application, that's the most boring part because uh, it works, yeah? So I'm logged on uh, to the Chrome using the Microsoft accounts here. And when I'm logged on to Office 365, it just worked, yeah? So that's always boring part with the SSL when it works. Uh, but we can go here and uh, see the integration part. Uh, so you, you see here uh, endpoints, and those endpoints are provided in your application metadata. Yeah. So whatever you're configuring, you're, I'm actually using here uh, 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 Azure AD as a SSO, and I have a certificate here. And this is the most quirky part because every application has it differently, has it done differently, yeah? So this form where you provide something, do you have to provide the certificate or not? That's always like a different, yeah? So you have to figure out with every application, but Azure AD is providing it. So we have added just a XAML-based application here uh, using built-in uh, functionality. So if you have Azure AD, XAML is just handled out of the box. There's a couple of things which uh, are, uh, like, good to know. Uh, Joe was mentioning about it. XAML is specifying like SP initiated, like passive and active uh, request, yeah. So uh, stating it's simple, the SP initiated, like browser initiated, so it's I'm going to the browser, uh, to the application, application knows where to redirect me, yeah. And then uh, when I get the token, I know how to redirect back to the application, yeah. The IDP initiated is a bit tricky because that I have to go to IDP first and I have to say I want to go to this application. It gives me a token for this application and I'm going to the application, yeah? So when you have IDP initiated, for example, with IDFS, you have this IDP initiated endpoint, you can select application and then it will redirect you. So uh, Azure AD apparently has the same endpoint, which is my apps. There is a client, my apps, Microsoft.com, and when you have an IDP initiated uh, profile, so actually, this tile here is acting as your application selector. So you have to tell your users to go here, click it, and it will do the job, yeah? Then, uh, so that, that, that took me a while to figure. It's in a technet, of course, but who is the documentation? And then uh, there's something which I uh, like fight all the time with the XAML applications. So, uh, Azure AD is allowing you to do your authentication in many different ways, yeah? So you can do uh, device-based out, you can do uh, Azure AD joint machine, so then actually it's a certificate uh, uh, authentication. But on the other hand, we have those providers, and when provider is doing the uh, XAML request, so they can specify what kind of authentication they are allowing. And what we found out is that a lot of applications using XAML are specifying exactly that, for example, they are allowing only a password, yeah? Or they are allowing only the uh, certificate. And then uh, your users who are logging using the username and the password, for them it will work. But for example, if they will go to the Azure AD joint machine, so it will, it will stop working, yeah? So this application I was uh, showing to you, the 7Gs is exactly, uh, it's exactly uh, this uh, example of something like this because I'm logged on here to Azure AD uh, using my apps. 
if I will go like this, if I will go just to the application, so SSO will work, yeah? So I log down, yeah? But then if I will just open an incognito in private mode and I will do the same, and I will start the same uh, operation. So I will log on to, the, uh, to this application. Yeah, I need to pull my password. Oh, sorry. It's, uh, I don't know my passwords. I rely on password managers. So I will sign in to the, to the application using the same Azure ID and using the same configuration. So actually, well, okay, it worked. But uh, typically it will, so uh, yeah. So demo was not working because typically what they are doing, they are uh, uh, failing uh, with this communicate that the application uh, the requested authentication method was password and we are not allowing it. And what I found out is that typically the application is saying, oh, it's your fault, change it, yeah? But it's not your fault because your users can use a different authentication methods and they should support all of them. So you have to go there and prove them, yeah? And how to prove it is actually the best way is to use the Fiddler, as Joe was explaining, because in a Fiddler you can capture all of this traffic and uh, you can capture whatever is sent to the whatever is sent to the applications. Yeah. So, for example, here is the. Uh, so I was logging on to to uh, 7Gs. This is the request which sent, was sent to the 7Gs. If you will send it, if you will capture this in the Fiddler, you can always get a XAML response or some XAML request, and uh, you can copy it. And I wanted to show you one tool which uh, Joe was not showing yesterday, which is uh, XAMLTool.io. If you know it, who knows XAMLTool? Yeah, one person. So actually, the, the nice thing is that what you can do here is you can pass your uh, you can pass your XAML request or response, and it will decode it for you. Yeah. So it's a, like a XAML. Uh, token decoder, so you don't have to understand how it works, how to decode it, just pass it here and you will get the output. output. So uh, those, those are the, the two typical cases where, I have, where we were having problems with, a, uh, with a, uh, XAML applications. As I said, uh, my favorite tools is uh, Fiddler XAML tool IO. There is a JVT IO, this is for OpenID Connect tokens. So it's also if you have to decode OpenID Connect token, so uh, then it will help you with it. Uh, oh, I'm running out of time, no. So this is a typical scenario when, when organization is allowing people to access their uh, applications. But then there is a typical scenario of guests. Who has to handle external consultants or uh, external people working with your applications? Well, only three persons, but actually, uh, in my experience, everybody. So that's, <laughs> I don't know what you're doing, how you're doing it, but, uh, so typically, uh, organizations needs to allow external people to access some of their applications. And uh, what we are doing is working well for, uh, for internal people, but actually, when we, are st when we are starting to deal with the external people, there is a problem with it. So how to manage contractors, how to manage the business guests, and a uh, typical solution on premises was to create a, either separate forest for that or to create them account in, a, in our forest, yeah? The problem I have with it is that when I'm creating an account for a user in my forest, I am not controlling what he has access to, yeah? So he's the same as my user, yeah? If I have it in a separate forest, okay, he's separate, but still, if he has an AD account, he can log onto the workstation. So that was always my issue with a, with a uh, external users. When we went to the cloud, uh, the, especially Microsoft Cloud, there is a nightmare of live ID accounts. So uh, whenever you need a consultant to work on your Azure, people are asking, what is your live ID account? They are adding this account to their tenant, and they, after a year, they don't know who Teddy Bear is. Yeah? 
because Life ID account is basically a consumer grade account. So you should not allow Life ID accounts in your tenant. So the question is how we can do, deal with it with, uh, in Azure AD. Uh, who knows Azure AD B2B? Yeah, it's a couple of users uh, of people here. First of all, Azure AD B2B, just basics, it's not a separate version of Azure AD, it's a feature of Azure AD, yeah? Uh, we have Azure AD, we have Azure AD B2C, and a lot of people outside are thinking that B2B is a separate version, but actually it's a feature, it's available in every version of uh, Azure AD. So what it does, it is allowing you to invite external people from different tenants to your tenant. So uh, it is creating an object in your tenant, but actually this is not like a new user, but it's a pointer to the other tenant, yeah? So uh, when we have a Predica, Predica has their own tenant, they have applications in this tenant, so I can invite a user from a different tenant to my tenant, and all the authentication is happening here. In my tenant, I have a pointer to this one, and what is good is that, for example, I can apply my conditional access on this user when he's, up allowing, when he's accessing applications in my tenant, yeah? So uh, a scenario how we, for example, use it at Predica is that I have my Predica account, I work with a the customer, they have a Visual Studio, I need access to this Visual Studio, they are creating a B2B guest for me, and I can access their Visual Studio with my Predica account, yeah? So it's a guest account, uh, uh, it's a guest account uh, uh, scenario. So how it works? So when I'm in, oh, we'll see if it will be working right now, yeah? Again. Let's give Azure one more, one more chance. Uh, when, you are, when you are in your uh, tenants, so you have a users, and here you have a new guest user. So this is the way how you are inviting people from external tenants to your tenant, yeah? Uh, the other way is there is a PowerShell command for that, and uh, there is an API for that. So you can, uh, in theory, you can build application for managing the guests. Uh, uh, what is interesting is that in the last week, Microsoft has released a preview of uh, whitelisting or blacklisting tenants. So I can say that I can invite guests, but only from this tenant, or I can ban, ban some tenants from being invited to mine. Yeah? So that's a very interesting feature. If I want to create a guest user, so I just need to type his username. And now I need to check. No, no password. I think the user is Joe Smith at W2KPL. And I, I can type a reason. Like, uh, I think we will work together. And that's it. You can delegate this task. So if there is a guest inviter role in Azure AD, so you can delegate this task to somebody who is not an administrator on Azure AD. And my user here, I'm logged on here as this guest user, he should get an invite for a Predica tenant. Yeah, so I got the invitation from Predica tenant. It is stating who invited me, uh, what was the reason? Actually, I can invite users directly to a specific application as well. So I can allow him to access only a certain application. I need to redeem this. So uh, I need to click on the link and log on with my uh, organization account. So if I will do it, actually I'm logged on already so that it will not prompt me for the credentials. So it's welcome to Predica. It is actually setting up right now this account, this shadow account in my tenant. And I'm here, yeah, so as you can see, right now this user has access to uh, its own Active Directory, that's my uh, tenant, like W2KPL, and then this, the same user, don't bother with this name here, that's because I got a free lifetime uh, uh, tenant from Microsoft, but they are punishing me with this display name. <laughs> uh, so I have access to Predica tenant, and what I can do right now is, for example, if I'm external consultant, so I can go directly to the, to the Azure portal, portal. And in Azure portal, I have actually access right now to Predica Azure. So if I will see here on the list, I have a Predica tenant, yeah? So I can start to work on their, uh, on their uh, resources in Azure. 
and I'm treated as their user, they can apply their policy, but actually they don't have to maintain my password because authentication is happening in my tenant. Yeah? Over time, so right now you can enforce uh, conditional access on the users uh, with a B2B, and over time there is a, uh, there, should, it should, there should be more controls on the, on the guests. Yeah? But right now, for example, if user is coming from other tenant and the MFA is not enforced, so I can enforce MFA on this user when he's ac accessing my application. Yeah? And this is the right way to grant access for external people to your applications using Azure AD if, if they have their own Azure AD tenant, and then what if they don't? Uh, so the current pattern for that is that uh, a lot of, a lot of organizations are establishing a guest tenant. So uh, whoever is working with the Microsoft is familiar with partners at Microsoft.com. So this is actually the separate Azure AD tenant for a guest. Yeah? But if somebody was watching Ignite, uh, there was a very interesting uh, scenario where you can invite somebody directly to your tenant, for example, using Gmail accounts. So, but this is coming. So this is B2B in its simplest form. So this is how to allow external people to work with our application and how to solve this problem with the consultants uh, who requires the password, who requires the account in our on-premises uh, environment to access some applications. Uh, so a few things uh, about the like, practical implications of, of it. Uh, there is no tool right now to manage guest workflow. So, okay, I can invite them, but actually, uh, like six months later, I want to do a view of what kind of a guest I have, and there is no tool for that. So, if somebody has the right uh, resources, you can write it, put it on the marketplace, uh, because there is nothing like this right now. And uh, what was enrolled, like uh, during the Ignite, is actually a review of the guest account. So, I can point to a certain resource, like an Azure subscription, or I can point to a groups in Office 365, and I can say, okay, attestate all guest accounts there. And then group owners has to say, okay, I keep this guest account, I, I remove this guest, guest account. A uh, thing which is not on the slide deck here is that uh, you have to be careful with what is default access for a, group, for a guest. So for example, when you're using group Office 365 groups, by default, guests can see all the open groups. There is a control for that, which you can apply using PowerShell. But uh, then you don't want to all the guests just starting to see all your group, group Office 365 group content. And then uh, the should is a keyword here. So uh, if you are planning to enable some co like uh, application for guests, always test it because, for example, in, por in Azure Portal. When you invite a uh, consultant to work on your Azure portal, uh, VMs are working like a charm. But uh, go to, for example, uh, Data Lake, and uh, well, it might turn out that Data Lake is not working with the B2B accounts. Yeah? So always test it, like test application by application. Is it working or not? That's like a rule of thumb for that. Okay, so we are talking about uh, uh, cloud applications, so how to do uh, access to uh, Azure AD apps, XAML apps, but there's still a lot of on-premises apps, yeah? So who, ha who is running on-premises app? That's a good question. <laughs> but yeah, everybody. Uh, so yeah, so organizations are still having on-premises apps. So uh, typical workloads we are dealing with are SharePoint and SQL reporting services. So that's something everybody are asking, like, okay, so how we provide access to a, a SharePoint or SQL reporting services for people who are outside of our organization? Because SharePoint, okay, it might be claim aware, but in typical scenarios, on-prem SharePoint is still Kerberos based, and SQL reporting services are Kerberos based. And uh, uh, Typical scenarios where we are being asked this question is, for example, uh, where, where there is a group of organizations, group of companies, each of them is running their, their separate Office 365 tenant, for example, and separate Azure AD, and separate uh, uh, on-prem AD, and they are asking how my user from on-prem AD can access your uh, SharePoint or SQL, yeah? So the question is how we can publish uh, and how we can use the uh, Azure AD to publish uh, on-prem applications and give a single sign-on to on-prem application. And the answer is Azure AD Web Application Proxy. So who work uh, uh, with a web, web application proxy on-premises in, in a ADFS? 
a cut off here. So uh, Azure AD Web Application Proxy is similar service just run by Microsoft. So it's a, in basics, it's a reverse proxy uh, with a nice feature of pre-authentication with Azure AD. So you can just publish the application using HTTP or HTTPS and uh, make it available to the people outside. And if they are going for the same point, so they are pre-authenticated with Azure AD. So you can actually, there are two modes. One is that you can do the pass-through authentication, just allow the traffic inside your network. And the second is that you can require a pre-authentication on it. The second feature which we are, we are using a lot is that actually Azure AD Web Application Proxy can exchange Azure AD token for a Kerberos on-premises token. Yeah, so I can publish my application for uh, people outside. They are authenticating using Azure AD. They are going inside and they are getting the, uh, they are getting Kerberos token. So in typical scenario, we have some Kerberos based applications here on premises. We have Azure AD. Uh, we have a web, uh, we have to deploy Azure AD web application proxy connector. That's a piece of software you are installing on premises. You can install multiple versions of it, so you can install it like uh, for a load and for a resilience. Uh, you can install multiple connectors. You can group them, so you can have a multiple connectors group, which are handling in different applications. And then uh, when you have an external URL, what Azure AD application proxy is doing, it is publishing internal URL on an external URL, but it requires user to be authenticated using Azure AD. How it is exchanging a token from, uh, from Azure AD to an uh, on-premises token? Actually, it is based on the URLs, on, on the UPNs. So it is taking the content of the token from Azure AD. This goes to the on-premises agent, and it is doing a Kerberos constraint delegation. So it works only with the Kerberos applications. Yeah? Uh, and you have to allow a Kerberos constraint delegation. If it will find a user with the same UPN, it is uh, issuing a token for this, uh, for this user. So what you need is Azure AD Premium, uh, at least basic. So uh, it is not available in a free version, so you have to have a basic at least, uh, or P1, P2. Uh, if you want to publish application on your own domain, you need a SSL certificate for this domain. Otherwise, it will be published using uh, Microsoft domain. And, uh, the nice thing about Azure AD Web Application Proxy is that you don't have to publish this externally over a network. So it's all based on the outgoing connections, so you don't have to go to the network department and say, can you publish this port? All of it is on, based on the outgoing connections, uh, which simplifies entire setup. What you need to do is to configure it and uh, allow access to those network ports and to those uh, URLs, and then you're all set. So you can use your web application proxy to, to connect to the internal uh, applications. Well, so we have a challenge. Let's see if right now uh, the portal will work. No. Okay, so I have a, a I have a, a few connectors installed. Oh, okay, sorry. You still see the deck. So what we have, we have a uh, we have an on-premises application, or uh, on-premises server. So this is virtual machine. This virtual machine has an application proxy installed. Uh, so basically, you are installing it. There is no configuration. You are just setting it up, and then uh, in in Azure portal, you can see those uh, proxies. So I can see I have a two proxy groups deployed. One has a one node. Here I have uh, two nodes, uh, so you can have uh, multiple nodes and uh, multiple groups, and then when you are publishing application, you are deciding on which group it is actually being published. And uh, yeah, and it's not working anymore. So again, so I will just show it to you on the video again. Sorry for that. So I just want to go to the setup of the app. So the setup of the app is uh, fairly simple. When we are publishing application using, uh, using web application proxy, what we need to do is specify what is internal URL, so what we are connecting on premises, how we want to publish this outside, what will be external URL, 
what connector group are we uh, using, and do we want to use uh, pre-authentication or not? And that's all. So uh, I got this very interesting discussion with a, a gentleman from SAP recently when we are publishing this SAP using this connector. And they said, we want to see uh, how it works. What is the architecture? And I said, there is no architecture. It's Microsoft uh, service. So you just publish those two URLs. But how it's done? We don't know. It's cloud. Yeah. So it's very interesting sometimes to get, get those uh, uh, discussions. So what we have here it is actually a, a reporting service. So uh, what we have here is I have a reporting service configured. And uh, so internally, I have some uh, reports. It's a typical on-premises reporting service. Yeah. And then, again, this is a boring part, because if it works, it just works. So I'm uh, outside of my uh, on-premises network. I want to check my reports. Those reports are published using uh, Azure AD Web Application Proxy. I have actually my on-prem AD account which is my, where uh, UPN is matching my uh, cloud UPN. So when I will go there, I will just get there. So I'm working right now on my on-premises SQL reporting server, uh, being completely outside of my network, and I'm getting uh, there authenticated with uh, Kerberos. So as I'm saying with SSL, if it's working, it's just working, and it's very boring because it works. And uh, it behaves as, as any other, uh, on, like access to any other on-prem application. Yes, question. Can you somehow make it work with B2B, like uh, creating an Yes, I will show it to you in a moment. <laughs> That's next section of the presentation. So. <laughs> So the entire setup is here. Uh, yeah, so uh, portal is not working. So entire setup is here. I mean, uh, this is our setup. We are publishing the application. So we are saying we want to publish this application internally under this URL. We are doing pre-authentication using Azure AD. It is going to an on-premises component, web application proxy connector. And this connector actually is uh, getting a token from Azure AD. And what this connector does, it is requesting a Kerberos token. And it is going with this Kerberos token to this internal URL, and it is authenticating me. So this is your entire setup. There is no, no further setup. So that was the question I got from SAP, how it happens. And I said, well, it, it works. <laughs> so, yeah. So, uh, in the past, if you really want to do something like this, so you will require like, uh, where is my, so if you want to do something like this in the past, you will require like F5 or uh, Netscaler or whatever, which is very complex to set up, and then it costs a lot. And right now we can just deploy like one binary and it works, yeah. And we use it a lot for, with the customers right now because that's uh, less uh, like, advertised feature of Azure AD, but actually it is enabling so many scenarios that uh, it's very useful. Question? Yes, so... Yeah, so UAG uh, was very interesting product. The key word is was. Uh, yeah, you could do magic things with a UAG, but it's not there anymore, yeah? So uh, let's just get over it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what I can say about it. Actually, the main question from uh, customers who used to use the UAG is, can we replace UAG with it? Because you will be surprised, but people are still running UAG. And uh, the main problem for them is that you cannot buy license for UAG anymore from Microsoft, and they want to extend it. Uh, uh, but no, it's not like UAG. UAG was very sophisticated. You can do a lot of stuff with it. This is like, OK, reverse proxy with a pre-authentication. Yeah. But in my opinion, this is very powerful anyway. We did a migration. From UAG? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was the exact scenario. There was yeah. pre-authentication to curve, but it was, it, it was easy and it worked. It was yeah. So a few things to remember. It is still Kerberos application. So the fact that we are accessing this using SSL from uh, Azure AD 
doesn't mean that Kerberos uh, is omitted. So Kerberos has to work on prem. Yeah. So this was actually uh, this Twitter with a with a with a WAP, uh, with a SSO that actually was when we were fixing the problem with accessing the uh, the reporting services over over the WAP because you have to get the Kerberos right. Yeah. So SPNs has to be there. Delegation has to be configured. You have to first check that Kerberos is working on prem and then go to the Azure ADPs because if Kerberos is not working on prem, so it will not work over Azure AD. There is no magic. The uh, second thing uh, to remember is who is familiar with the Kerberos? Like, who knows how it works? Yeah, so good. Uh, so what we are doing effectively with a web application proxy, we are doing double hop. Yeah? Because what is being done is my, our credentials are going to the Azure AD connector, and Azure AD connector is using Kerberos constraint delegation to delegate our credentials to the SQL reporting service. So what is happening if SQL reporting service wants to delegate our credentials to the SQL? Actually, it can because that's the third hop. Yeah. So there, uh, uh, and and then what you need to do is uh, you need to enable. If you will go to Azure, if you will go to Azure to AD settings, get me on premises. So if you will go to uh, AD settings, uh, I don't have a delegation tab here, yeah. Yeah, because I don't have a. So what you need to do is to uh, there is a setting which is enable constraint delegation using Kerberos only or any protocol. And actually, you have to switch it to any protocol because what is being done is the Kerberos ticket is an exchange for NTLM ticket, and then it is using NTLM to connect to the SQL. Yeah. Yes. And by the way, this is the same scenario if you have a, if you are delegating like uh, that's something I. Uh, yeah, a few times I charged a lot of money for that uh, because that was we cannot make it done, and that was the only thing to change. Because, for example, you have this scenario that you have a constraint delegation to a SQL, and the SQL needs to talk to a different service on the same machine, and it cannot delegate using Kerberos. You have to switch to NTLM because uh, within the single service, it's NTLM. Yeah, yeah. So, that, so you have to remember that effectively you are doing double hop when you are getting to the application you have published. If there is a third hop, so it's a third hop. Yeah. So uh, something if you don't understand how Kerberos works, that's very tricky to find out. Yeah. But if you know how, how Kerberos works and you know that you have done double hop, so it's like becomes obvious that you cannot do the third one. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can tell it later. I have a few anecdotes about that, like flying to Norway just to fix it in a 15 minutes, and then uh, I was hired for a week. <laughs> uh, yeah, PSS had a lot of explanation to be done why they fixed it for two weeks. Uh, so yeah, we, we have published this, uh, this SQL reporting service to the external people from our organization, but what about the guests? So. <laughs> Actually, uh, it works because there's no difference. Uh, so if you have this, this setup, and we have those guest accounts, and we need to enable this guest account to get to our on-prem application, so what we need to do is actually we have to create here a shadow account for this user, which is guest in our tenant, and it will work like for our user. Yeah. So, uh, if you think about it, this is enabling a few interesting scenarios, like you with with um, a different uh, VPN. Yeah, I will show it to you in a moment. Yeah. So, uh, a scenario which might not be very obvious is that you might host you might host a Kerberos application for a company in AWS or Amazon or uh, Azure without any connectivity to on-prem and provide single sign-on because as long as you have an AD in this environment and the UPNs are matching, so it will work, yeah? So you can take SQL reporting service, put it on Azure, put some fake AD there, just provision users with the correct UPNs and it will work, yeah? So it's a very fancy scenario. 
The other fancy scenario is that if you have Azure AD, who knows about Azure AD domain services, ADDS? So you can like enable a copy of your Azure AD on premises. Uh, it is synchronizing the passwords, but actually you don't need a password with that. It is creating you a copy of, a, uh, of your Azure AD with all the UPNs. So just set up the SQL reporting server there and it will work. And actually I have the other copy of this reporting server working exactly in this setup when we have a Azure AD DS where the SQL reporting services are running and I can get a single sign on to it, yeah. It's uh, not very obvious, but there is a lot of, like you're removing all the need for VPNs between on-prem, you're removing the need of extending your on-prem AD to Azure uh, only with this web application connector, yeah. So getting back to our guests, uh, so yeah, so how to do it, uh, oh, sorry. So to set up the guest, you have to create a shadow account and uh, this on-prem shadow account has a UPN uh, in this format. So that's whatever the name is, X, just don't bother with uh, remembering it because you can always go uh, to Azure AD and just pull it out. So what I have here is uh, within my users, I have a setup for my uh, guest account, so I pre-staged it because I don't want to bother you with the clicking, but I invited the other guest uh, with this. Uh, uh, hmm? Yeah, uh, it's like my twin brother, but. <laughs> so I invited the, the guest user in the same way I did it previously for a B2B. And then uh, uh, this is the ordinary user in our AD, so I can put it as a graph, graph API and if you will go down there, so you can see that it's user principal name has this format. So it's actually a, a username at, and this is this on Microsoft.com uh, tenant we are all getting where uh, we are establishing Azure AD. By the way, you can talk to Rolf, who is speaking next to it, and there are some quirkness with this uh, tenant when you are setting MFA and authentication. Uh, but that's the different topic. And then we need to create on-prem account with the same UPN. So I've created here a uh, guest account and just, I have a UPN here. Uh, yeah. So you can see I have a UPN value which is matching this UPN for a guest. And now, uh, yeah, a lot of browsers. So I'm here logged on as this, uh, user uh, from my tenant and then I will go to the same reports and uh, again it is just working so it's boring <laughs> but uh, I just go to the on-prem Kerberos application using a user from the completely separate tenant uh, who doesn't exist actually in my, in my on-prem AD as a user. I have an object for that but he don't know the password, he never will log on to this account but he can get access to my on-prem application. And if you have to share the SharePoint, you have to share the SQL reporting service. So this is how you can do it and it just works. Uh, the setup of this is taking like five minutes. Uh, for anyone who is doing this with Kerberos, this is like magic, but uh, <laughs> because uh, in on-premises it would, it would require like uh, setting up a trust and everything and here is, there is no trust. So just establish a fake AD, synchronize all the, your group users from a, three different companies to this fake AD, establish a SharePoint there, and you have something you can share between them, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Where do, you, where do you usually run the connector? So connector, that depends uh, on a scale. Connectors are uh, typically deployed on a dedicated machines. And it's very efficient, so there is a scalability for that, uh, like a guide, and you can like, literally you can ha run hundreds, thousands of uh, connections on a single connector. So uh, typically you have to establish like two or three of those. Uh, you might establish more if you want, because the connector is a component which is actually talking to uh, this application, yeah? So depends on your uh, network environment, you can have a one connector group which is connecting to Exchange, and then you have a SharePoint in a different data center, so you can set up a second connector group in this data center for SharePoint and use them to, uh, to publish it. 
and then you uh, it is load balanced between those connectors by Azure AD so you don't have to you know, like load balance them internally with a five or something Azure AD is just redirecting traffic to those connectors and uh, when connector is starting it is actually getting a channel to uh, Azure uh, to the Azure AD so Azure AD knows which connector is online and also it is pushing the updates there so uh, it's very like easy to maintain. There is no configuration for that. There is nothing you can run to uh, like uh, configure this connector. It is just running. Yeah. So what about auditing uh, of the use of that account uh, in your on-prem AD? And, uh, it's standard login to Azure to AD. So if you have a login enabled, so you'll see it in an audit log that user has logged on to this application. It's a Kerberos. So. But it is Yes, yeah, app. and he doesn't know the password. Depending on what the app can do. Yeah, yeah, so that's constrained, but that's why it is enabled only for a constraint delegation. Right. Because you are enabling connector to do delegation, but all, only to the okay. certain, yes, 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 yeah. So it's, uh, it's constraint delegation. You cannot, like, replicate it whatever you want, yeah. Okay. So Azure AD WAP has a certain, has a few scenarios. The one is, uh, Oh, yeah, so one is Windows based. This is what I was showing to you. That's very obvious. Uh, second, when people are using it, it's a pass-through authentication, pass-through traffic. So they have a XAML application or they have a form-based ap application, and they just want to publish it, and they don't want to bother with F5, whatever. Uh, so they are using this as a reverse proxy, and it just works as a reverse proxy. Then. This is a very interesting scenario. So we are working right now with one of the customers who is like uh, phasing out Mobile Iron. And what I learned is that Mobile Iron was actually when you deploy Mobile Iron on, a, on a iOS, so what it does, it is opening always a VPN connectivity to your network. And this is how the applications are working through the Mobile Iron because they are on-premises. Yeah. Uh, if you are phasing out a uh, mobile errand, so you, suddenly you have an application or on your iOS who doesn't have access to on-premises anymore, so you have to replace it with something. And if you will enable this iOS application with the ADAL, like Microsoft Modern Authentication, so actually this application can connect to the web application proxy and it can go directly to your uh, on-prem through the web application proxy. So that's something where uh, which you can do with it. And there is a scenario with uh, remote desktop apps. So actually you can establish a remote desktop gateway and a web app and publish it using this scenario. And suddenly you have a SSL to the remote desktops for, uh, for uh, Azure AD users. Yeah? And you can connect to the terminals using authentication. And then, of course, it needs to be tested, but you should be able to apply uh, all the conditional access for that you can apply MFA on those users, whatever. Yeah, so that's a very interesting scenario. And there is one more. Do you know what it might be? It's actually, uh, I call it ping the header because that's a header-based authentication. So apparently there is a, a lot of applications which are, uh, their security is based on the headers, which I don't know why they are doing it like this, but it's like this. So the authentication is based on the fact that the request contains a header and this header was issued by the specific authority, like a single sign-on server. And uh, yeah, typical scenarios, that's Oracle, SAP, IBM, they have those apps. And, and uh, if you want to sign on to those applications, you have to go there with the request with a specific header in it, yeah? And this is why Microsoft uh, did this partnership with a pink. So when you are having, uh, when you have Azure AD, so you are allowed to use ping access. Uh, there are some restrictions on it, but basically you can just download ping access, install on-prem. Uh, restrictions are that ping access, uh, then it's limited for, it, is, it can use only Azure AD as a, as a provider. So the full blown version of ping access can query the data from the SQL database, from LDAP, whatever. With, a, with this version, you can go only to Azure AD for attributes. And it is supporting up to 20 applications counted as the URLs. If you are over 20 applications, you have to go and get a quote from the pink. So it's a good business relationship. 
and uh, how it works, it is actually the pink access is acting as an open ID uh, connect client. It is going to uh, Azure AD, it is obtaining a token, the JWT token, and based on this token and the rules specified in Azure AD, uh, it is constructing the header which is going to application. Uh, I don't have it set up, uh, but this is the project we are working right now as a Predica. Apparently there is a lot of Oracle business suite deployed in some countries. I don't know how it's in the US, but uh, in the Middle East, every customer has an Oracle a business suite. And uh, if you want to do SSO to Oracle a business suite, so you need to buy Oracle Access Manager, you have to buy Oracle Internet Directory, you have to set it up, and it costs a lot of money. Uh, that's the main question why uh, people are asking about it. And if you look at the diagram, this entire setup, Oracle Access Manager, Oracle Internet Directory, is for uh, producing two headers, which one contains the user grid and the second contains the user name. And those headers are going into the request and they are hitting something which is called Oracle EBS Access Gate. If EBS is seeing those headers, so uh, it is authenticating a user, yeah. Uh, so the setup looks a bit like this. Uh, if you want to do it with Azure ED, so you're establishing application connector, pink access. Pink access has a configuration for, which is enabling this entire flow with the headers. When user is authenticating, it is going to on-prem through the application connector still. So you're using this reverse proxy, but if the application is using pink access, so pink access will request a JWT token with open ID. It will get this token it will transfer this into the headers and it will sign on user to the, to the Oracle idea EBS. Yeah, it's very cumbersome to set up, so that's why I don't have virtual machines with it. But actually it's very interesting because it is enabling SSO to many different uh, applications which are not Windows based, yeah. And uh, we are getting more and more requests on that. So with this, the, uh, the scenarios follow up or extend it to this one, header based authentication. Uh, as I said, this will be mostly like Oracle SAP, that kind of stuff. Okay, so those are the scenarios I want to speak about to you today and then a bit of what I think where it is going to or what I expect further with it. So yeah, we know, uh, all I know what Alex said, identity is a new control plane, but actually this is how it is. Uh, Gil had a very interesting talk yesterday about are we going like, are we ready to delegate our identity to the cloud providers? But the reality right now is that a lot of people are having a, uh, Azure AD and they are starting to use it. So we have a large multinational organization. The guys from my company are working with them and they are right now going with all their applications to Azure AD and they are moving to web application proxy and whatever they will acquire in the future will be integrated with Azure AD because they have to enable those scenarios. Uh, so whatever provider will, will it be? So I think that those are the scenarios we will be using going forward. Uh, Azure AD as a platform uh, actually has a very broad set of features because first of all, you can write applications against Azure AD. Uh, it is supporting OpenID Connect. Uh, it is not standardized for OpenID Connect, but uh, Microsoft is stating that they will finish uh, like certification in the spring 2018, so they will be certified for OpenID Connect as a, as a provider. Then federated apps using XAML are addressing like most of the uh, enterprise applications and SaaS applications targeted on the enterprise. Uh, I think that the abom abomination in the SaaS world is that they are charging for XAML support. So uh, if you are going, for example, for DocuSign, uh, Either you have a login and a password, or you have to pay like 10,000 bucks for getting the SSO, uh, which is stupid, and you should ask your uh, provider why, how you want to compensate the fact that you're making this less secure because I need to issue the new username and the password. But that's my opinion, they don't share it. Uh, then, web application proxy is enabling those on-prem applications, which I think is very interesting and important because this is allowing us to publish all those Windows applications to the user which are outside. So I can get my iPhone right now and I can connect to my reporting server uh, without any F5, whatever, just using Azure AD and it works. I can show it to you later if you want it. It's all standard based and whatever Microsoft is doing right now, I think they are doing better on the standard support. 
uh, if you're using ADAL, but actually not the standards, they are using still protocols, but ADAL is very specific for them, but you can write an application against Azure AD using Open AD Connect or OAuth, and uh, it will work, so I think it's very important. And there's a set of features on top of all of those scenarios, which I'm not even speaking about, like conditional access and risk-based measures. And when I'm thinking about an organization where the goal is to enable like, users to access applications, so it's very hard right now to any organization to establish the same level of security which Microsoft or Amazon is giving to you because you have to figure it out on your own. And here you have this mechanism to get a single sign-on and at the same time you're getting the mechanism to protect your user. So it's a very good like, value offering in my opinion, uh, but that's me. Uh, what is important is uh, they are starting to address uh, access review and compliance right now, but uh, unfortunately probably this will be P2 level of licenses, which is getting pretty expensive. But if an organization doesn't have any compliance solution on-prem, so they can use this and you can start to attestate who has access to my applications on a, like every six months, yeah? And I don't, maybe it's not that important in the States, I believe it is, but in Europe, uh, GDPR is starting to force people to do it uh, in some ways. So Peter will be speaking about GDPR later. Uh, so I think that on top of all this protocol support, uh, features, and how we can use it, those things are making this very, very good value-based proposition, like you're paying your money and you're getting SSO and you're getting conditional access and you're getting MFA, and it's hard to match on premises if you want to build it on your own. Uh, the way I'm looking for, forward is uh, next year they will support, uh, they will enable two scenarios. So one is who is using Live ID account or Microsoft account? You know that you can log on without the password with the phone. There is a, there is a way to log on to Microsoft account without the password using Microsoft Authenticator. And spring 2018, they will enable this to uh, Azure AD. And you will be able to log on to Azure AD without the password, just using your phone. And then uh, in the fall 2018, at least that was announced on Ignite, uh, they will support <coughs> Fido. So you will be able to use YubiKeys to secure your uh, 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 access to the applications. And one thing which is hard to pass right now uh, is YubiKey or any Fido compliant device. So I'm looking for those two uh, improvements which will, in my opinion, significantly improve the security of the access to the applications if you will integrate with Azure AD. That's my point of view. Uh, so with that, I thank you. That, and uh, We are having a company blog where I uh, write about those stuff. So actually all the scenarios I covered today, they are described there in articles, so feel free to go there. And if you have any questions, I'm sure. And yeah, other than that, I thank you for that, for the time. <laughs> so feel free to ask questions. <laughs>